bring up. This is it. You have to give me permission. Uh oh, it says meeting. We're streaming live on Facebook. Let me just take a peek on Facebook. Hello, everyone. Uh, joining us on the Facebook live feed. If you can just give me a minute or so to attend to some technical issues, and then we'll go ahead and get officially started. So, yep, we're both showing up on Facebook. So that's a good thing. And I am just going to bounce over to my personal page. So hopefully some people can join us from there. So good evening, everyone. I see we have some live viewers with us and welcome to this evening's live cast sponsored by Mindful Ohio and the Institute for Creative Mindfulness. Uh, I'm Dr. Jamie Marich, and I'm very happy to be joined tonight by Soraya Papayut, who I have not previously known in a conversational or in-person way before this. We are Facebook friends. Uh, we were talking before the meeting how Soraya has followed my work for some time and uh, developed a Facebook friendship a little while back. And I thank you very much for accepting the invitation, the call that I put out there to come on and, and speak your experience. So if you wouldn't mind unmuting yourself and telling us just a little bit about your background, both personally and professionally. So uh, I'll go and talk about uh, professionally. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, so professionally, I am a master's level social worker. I got my MSW from Barry University in Miami uh, two years ago. And now I work with uh, specifically uh, Haitian children. Um, I work in that community in, in Lake Worth, Florida. Um, and I kind of help facilitate um, in individual counseling and uh, family counseling as well. Um, that's a little bit about me professionally. Personally, um, I am Haitian American. My family, I'm first generation. My family from Haiti. I was born here um, in New Jersey, um, in America. Uh, and uh, I uh, moved to Florida, been living here my whole life. So that's about it about me. Great. So what you want to speak about tonight, what you asked me to speak on is generational trauma. Yeah. And that is a term that many people, even in the counseling professions have heard of, but aren't really sure what it means. So yeah. help us understand a little bit about what generational trauma means. So generational trauma is, um, I, it's, this is something that I'm actually like researching right now as we speak, but it's actually something that it's, the way to explain it is um, feeling pain that wasn't, or a wound that wasn't inflicted on you. So it's not that it was inflicted on you personally, but it was inflicted on someone else and they are perpetuating that on you. So when you say generational, um, if I can speak about like, you know, specifically the black community or even like anyone who's been in um, a traumatic situation, you think of a uh, a soldier, you can think of a Holocaust survivor, you can think of someone who was a slave. Um, if they're in that environment, and we know about trauma, if they're in that environment for a very long time, you know, always in survival mode, you know, you, you get out of that, and you still have your, your DNA, you know, they say your DNA changed with trauma. Mm -hmm. and so you changed, and the way you behave, the way you um, react to other people change. So imagine that person who went through that traumatic experience and they have a child. Um, so the same way, you know, they uh, have the reaction that they've had or the, the things that have changed them, the way they see themselves, the way they see the world is how they will, they will perpetuate that onto the next person. So I'll say like an example would be a little, a little girl, let's say a mom who was abused as a child. Um, and they were told messages like, you know, your skin color is ugly, like, um, and you're, you know, you're too dark or whatever the case may be. And they put that onto that, that they have that thought uh, or belief and they put mm -hmm. that onto their child because that's what they believe. And that continues mm -hmm. to go on and on generational because that's something that was told to them, you know? Right. Um, so that's what, like I said, I'm still researching and, and, Mm -hmm. talking with people more about these things, but um, that's what I believe that is. And I think a common question that comes up that I get asked a lot is, is it truly just something that's passed down in the DNA or is it something that is passed down behaviorally because of the result of unhealed wounds? I feel it can be both. 
Yeah, I think I think so too. I think um, people can uh, model behavior, things that they mm -hmm. see, you know, and that's um, that's true. It, mm -hmm. And that's what for me, behavior is about beliefs. Though we know that mm -hmm. a belief, be, a behavior comes from a belief. So mm -hmm. if you have a belief of something, then you're behaving out of that belief, and that mm -hmm. that belief gets transferred, whether that person knows where the root of that belief is or not. So if we mm -hmm again, want to talk about racism. Um, mm -hmm. When you think of, when I think of like, you know, what was happening in this country, obviously someone had told someone else, hey, you know, black people are not, um, when we've been told like, we're not human, we're not, you know, we're not equal to other people. So those, those messages get transferred and generation to generation that's why we are where we are um i've seen videos of i mean literally 1960s of little girls saying you know we go we go into the white neighborhoods and um you know they throw rocks at us and they tell us to get out you know this is something in like the 1960s 1950s this is old an old mm -hmm. video um, and it's, it's still happening in 2020. And this mm -hmm. is because it's a belief, it's a mentality that's been mm -hmm. passed from generation to generation. And that's why we are where we are right now. So racism, obviously the word has been getting a lot of attention lately with good reason. Uh, mm -hmm. So let's go there, uh, okay. if you're willing. Yeah. Um, mm. are, are you willing to speak at all to what you've personally experienced? Yes. Um, <laughs> So I, I, I don't mind, I'm gonna be very transparent and open. And Please do, I welcome that. Organic, um, I've, I've experienced that in multiple ways, um, even as a child. So I, I did um, go to what they would call a white school and mm -hmm. middle school. And so going, going there, I, you know, being different, speaking from, a, speaking differently, cause I, mm -hmm. you know, English is not my first language and, basically being bullied because of my skin complexion, people would, mm -hmm. you know, call me darky and mm -hmm. midnight and they'll make, make all these jokes. And mm -hmm. um, it, this is really hard for me to talk about, but the one of the reasons why I am talking about this is because there's other women who this has happened to, there's other yeah. people that this has happened to, and they've been keeping this in for a very long time. And so yes. that's the reason why I'm saying this, but, um, that that was an experience that I had. I've had also other experiences, you know, going, I've been around like a lot of people that were, that didn't look like me, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I, they, people would always say, oh, you, I didn't know you were a black girl. You know, you don't sound mm -hmm. like a black girl. Mm -hmm. like, what, is, what does that mean? <laughs> what mm -hmm. does a black girl sound like? I mean, this is, mm -hmm. This may seem like a first time thing, but a lot of people talk about stuff like this. You know, what is what does a black girl sound like? What does that mean? And, you know, people have been changing the language and saying, you know, I'm educated, you know, mm -hmm. what, what, that's so things like that. Um, those type of things. I mean, there's there's so much that we can go into. It could be right. in color, whether it's my hair, mm -hmm. you know, before I had before I had a fro, I had dreads. So, mm -hmm. you know there's a stigma with that so yeah so i i mean I, if you're willing i'd like to explore this thing about messaging because i think you hit the nail right on the head earlier that we we react from the beliefs we've internalized mm -hmm. and when they come with some type of traumatic charge they tend to be fiercer and if those negative beliefs are maladaptive or ugly they can play out in very maladaptive and ugly ways and right. uh Interestingly, an example that I use in, in my new book that's coming out next month, Trauma on the 12 Steps, talking about this concept called oppressive cognitions. And it was a term coined by a, a friend of mine, and I'll make sure I hook you up with her research since I know you're researching this. And it's essentially these negative beliefs that we've received as a result of who we are, mm -hmm. whether it be because of sexuality or race or ethnicity and their beliefs we've internalized. And one of the negative beliefs that I use as an example, as I explain it, is that dark-skinned women aren't beautiful because I, one of my mentors is a dark-skinned black woman and I know she has shared a lot of that pain with me. Mm -hmm. um, so before the call, before we got on broadcast and we were talking privately, we were mentioning about beauty standards mm -hmm. and just even Googling beautiful woman and what comes back or, so if you can help us have some personal illumination 
on where all this fits into even what, what makes someone a beautiful woman and how that has been distorted. I mean, I think that comes from like images, you know? Yeah. And to be honest, this is something that's been talked about in the black community a lot. The things yeah. that you see, if you don't see a lot of, like in the movies, if you don't see a lot of dark skin, natural hair, black women, then that's, you know, if you see the opposite, then it's, it makes someone feel like, you know, there's not a lot of people like me. If you see successful people that don't look yeah. like you and what you see is, um, well, I've seen, you know, the way that I've seen successful black women before, now it's getting a lot better, but before it was, you know, in movies like The Help, you know, and mm -hmm. things like that, it was always doing, it was always looked at in a negative light. Mm -hmm. um, and they were, they had to do certain things to get into a light, you know, mm -hmm. and um, the, the beauty standards as well, like um, showing women who are white um, in advertisements and in movies and those type of things, like just not being able to see a, a proper representation of yourself mm -hmm. in a successful light. As yeah. a child, I, I didn't have that, you know, there was yeah. not a lot of that, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm interested in your perspective specifically as a Haitian American, okay. uh, being, being a child of immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think, if at all, your experience of racism may have differed from other black people who've been in this country, who again, more, more of the connection generation, generationally over the years. Cause um, I'm, I'm reading some things right now suggesting the experiences might be different, but you're the expert here of your lived experience. So I want to know your thoughts on that. Well, I mean, <laughs> um, this is again, something that's been talked about in the black community of like Haitians, you know, in the beginning, when I was younger, it was actually like not a good thing to be, uh, to be Haitian. Um, people used to, to lie about it. I had to lie and, you know, say I was mm -hmm. just black. You know, I couldn't tell mm -hmm. people that thing because, they were being, Haitians were being hated, like, and made fun of and beat up and all those mm -hmm. things. And people talk about that, actually, nowadays. They'll say, you know, back in the days, like, people didn't like Haitians at all. And I don't, I don't think it's a historical thing. Um, if you think, look back in the history of Haiti, like, the, we were the first uh, Black people to free ourselves from slavery. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a big thing. And then people say, because of that, we've been paying for it. Um, and mm. that's what makes us, I guess, the poorest, one of the poorest countries. Um, but I feel like we, I, I feel like we are stronger because of it, just as a people, no matter what, we still, we're still thriving. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, we're good. Um, as far as like my parents, I think that it's, it's pretty, um, courageous for someone who is from another country and specifically that country to come to this country, don't know this language, don't know anything about this place and mm -hmm. to be here, make a living, you know, first generation, those type of things. I think that's, that it was, it's amazing. And for me, I've never heard of my parents specifically experiencing racism. Maybe they did and they didn't understand. But for yeah. me, I know that I personally have, so I, I'm pretty sure they have as well. Right. And a question that comes up sometimes when generational or historical trauma is discussed is, do you believe resilience can also be generational? Yes. That's something that, you know, you can't talk about trauma without resiliency. Right? So go on. Tell me what you've yeah. learned. In recovery, you know, resiliency. Like, I think one of the ways to do that is to, is to empower yourself. Remember, remembering your history, remembering what you came from, remembering what you've overcome. And that's kind of like, for me, that's what I do. That's how I... Uh, I would say strengthen my resiliency is to remind myself of who, who I am, the things that I've gone through. And you could think of that generationally too. We, we think about, you know, the black ancestors, the people who came from the ships, you know, who came into this country, were slaves, uh, civil rights movement, been through all those things and still standing till this day. That is the definition of resiliency. For sure. Uh, and, and that's like generational of like pain and suffering. Mm -hmm you know, as a person, just for your skin complexion, which is not something that you can control, that like you literally woke up like this. Um, 
So sorry, I'm getting a little passionate. <laughs> no, go. I love this. <laughs> I, I want to hold space for this for sure. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, um, it's, it's, it's definitely generational. It's something that we, the black community talks about all the time, um, of how we are resilient. We've been through so much and losing our history and not knowing the basics of the basics of like, you know, stuff like what tribe did I come from, those type of things, you know, Latin, losing that history and, and still being able to, to find our identity and, and know who we are and become something, mm -hmm. even though things are not equal, you know, mm -hmm. it's not equal, but you're, you're still able to fight and get mm -hmm. to that level, you know? So let's discuss that because I've seen a lot of advocacy and I agree with it for really teaching black children that your history did not begin with slavery. Yes, <laughs> that's big. <laughs> it did not begin with slavery. We were yeah. way, we're better people than that. That's not, that's not who you are. If you, and I say that's not who you are, obviously we are not slaves, but when I say mm -hmm. ancestors, you know, that's not who your ancestors were. That's not where you came from. That's not what your yeah. history is. History is everything. You know, mm -hmm. that's why, unfortunately, we have like um, historical monuments being taken down and those type of things. History is everything. It's a part of your identity. Mm -hmm. It's a part of who you are. So if you tell me that um, all I know about my history or people who are like me is mm -hmm. they were slaves, that, 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 that doesn't do well for me. That, that makes mm -hmm. me feel like I don't have a lot of hope. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where I came from. So I know you work with children and and have that insight so what would you like children black children to know about their history well i want i just want them to know that um you know originally because with people there are people still doing research and learning different things originally black people were people who were civilized you know they knew math they knew science they had all the, those things before and smart people and even if you look at um, the history of American history, if I can, because I'm American, so most yeah, of the go. things mm -hmm. that I know is American, um, you know, the things that we have done for this country, you know, the typical things like Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King, those are, uh, that is your history, that, that is who you are, you're, you're mm -hmm. made to be someone who's a fighter, you're made to be resilient, that's in your DNA, mm -hmm. your, your ancestors fought. You know, so reminding like even the Haitian kids that, that I do therapy with, that your family, your ancestors came to this country um, to, to become better. And they, they fought through things before so that you are able to, and you have that in you, it's inside of you already. You just gotta, you have to tap into that. Mm -hmm. It's a very trauma focused way to approach it. And I, I'm glad that, that you're doing that work. So I know you said that you want to be, be researching this further. Uh, so the, the part of me, this is, this is the, the, the doctoral part of me. I, I, I'm curious what specifically interests you within this larger field. What are some of the questions you want to ask and explore? So I, I've been learning recently about like epigenetics. I thought that mm -hmm. was pretty interesting. Um, I, got, I have to like, if I'm going to talk about it, I guess I have to bring out some definitions. I don't know if I have it here, but, um, I'm going to butcher it. Epigenetics. Do your best. Yeah. Epigenetics is basically generational trauma. That's like mm -hmm. the, the, that's the more uh, clinical term mm -hmm. or scientific term to mm -hmm. generational trauma where uh, trauma actually changes your DNA. So you can um, like, even for, you know, scientifically, if a, a mom is pregnant with a child and something traumatic happens, though that emotion, the, her hormones, the way she reacts, you know, goes into onto a baby. It's the same thing for mm -hmm. epigenetics. It changes your DNA. Um, so that's that's kind of like what I've been go like going into epigenetics and change the change of DNA because of trauma or generational trauma, mm -hmm. pain or or um, how how it affects. Um, a human being. So mm -hmm. if I could, my goal would be if I could like maybe uh, follow someone who maybe was a, a, a Holocaust survivor or, mm -hmm. or interview someone who was a Holocaust survivor or um, knows of someone who was uh, like in their mm -hmm. family were a Holocaust survivor mm -hmm. and follow their generation, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like with the biopsychosocial learning about their family history and kind of mm -hmm. learning about 
how did that, what transferred over? What, what beliefs were transferred over? Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of, I don't know how else to explain yeah. it. It's butchered. <laughs> No, no. And, and, and where I'm really resonating is your, your acute ability to identify this, you know, what beliefs are transferring over. Because mm -hmm. uh, if, I, if I could identify anything as a trauma specialist, it's these things we believe about ourselves that don't get resolved. And so much of what trauma recovery is about is learning a new truth, mm -hmm. learning a new message. And I'm so glad you talked about the importance of connecting to history, connecting to what is adaptive and full and rich about the experience. We, we had a comment here on the thread uh, from Donna. We often only speak about the struggles and a few of the fighters, but we never really share the fullness of who we are. Mm. And if I'm looking at another definition of trauma, I really like it's whatever that thing is that keeps us cut off from the truth and the fullness and the wholeness of who we are. Mm -hmm. And so much of that is like, we can look at what's the belief about self here and trace it. Where did it come from? And mm -hmm. as an EMDR therapist, I do a lot of that. Yet for so many of the types of traumas we're talking about, where does it come from? Goes long back before we were born. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's transferred from somewhere. It comes from somewhere. So that's, mm -hmm. like, that's exactly where, what I'm interested in. I think because of my own experiences, I always wanted, I also wanted to know like, where, where does this belief come from? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of what I will be doing with that work. Great. So if I can ask another personal question, sure. um, and how, how has everything that has happened in the last few weeks in the wake of George Floyd's death personally been affecting you? <laughs> Honestly, I've been mm -hmm. um, really, really emotional. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not a mother, but because I'm a therapist and I, you know, work with children, I feel like, you know, that could be, it could be anyone. I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm a daughter. I have a black father. Um, I have cousins, you know, I have clients. I, though it's very personal and it can happen to anyone. Um, but this, this, these, these things are not new to the black community. It's not a surprise. It's not, um, something that hasn't happened before. These, these are things that have happened before. It's just now, we're just now addressing it. Um, mm -hmm. for, the black, for the black community, it's like almost like, I mean, for me personally, I'll speak about me personally. I, mm -hmm. it's, we're in the middle of not just uh, American history, not black history, but like world history. This is something that black people have been holding on to for a very long time, you know, and I feel like I've been holding on to for a very long time, my whole life, my skin complexion, me being black, me being different, you know, police brutality, being, being afraid of the police, all of that is the black experience in general. Mm -hmm. That is our life. This is what we've been dealing with our whole entire life. And it's very interesting because now it's being broadcast and people are seeing this is every single day that I wake up this is what I experience every single day. Mm -hmm. It's not just because you're seeing it on camera. This is something that has always happened. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, other people are now becoming aware of it. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the only difference is that now people are becoming aware of it now because we live in 20, you know, we're in 2020, we have social media, we have Zoom, we have Facebook mm -hmm. Live. People can't hide the truth anymore. Now we need to talk about it. Um, yeah. We knew, I, I mean, I knew this was happening. Maybe there are some people who didn't know these things were happening, mm -hmm. but now people are being exposed and there has to be change. There has to be. What do you want to see happen with that awareness? I'm, I, there's, there's so much, especially being a social worker. I, you know, I, I feel like I'm, I feel like I was made for this social work. I was made to serve people. Um, that's my, that's my life's purpose. So. Mm -hmm. That means that I, I care too much. <laughs> That's how I feel. I feel like I care too much and I take on, you know, other people's pain, you know, mm -hmm. like I see it and I feel like it's me. So what I would like to see change is, um, I mean, there's too much. There's systems change all over. It affects mm -hmm. everything. It affects, affects your workplace. It, it affects this, um, the criminal justice system. The, mm -hmm. um, it affects every system, the school system. Mm -hmm. Every system needs to be looked at. And, right. and even, even social work, um, that's mm -hmm. social services was a, if we think, if we could talk about the history of social services um, mm -hmm. and how that have affected the black community, you know, with WIC and housing and 
um, you know, redlining. There's just so much that it's just too much to unpack, to unpack, unfold. Right. It's, it's just, there's so much to unfold. So this is all coming out now. And for me specifically, it's like the, all this has been inside me. So like when it's people are actually listening, it's just like the, the basics of trauma, the things that I've learned about trauma. When you have mm -hmm. been, you know, you've experienced something and it's real, but someone is telling you this, that it's not, that is trauma. <laughs> and mm -hmm. there's been a, a group of people for years saying, this is happening to me. And, and then there's a group of people who are saying this is not happening. Or mm -hmm. if they are saying that it's happening, they know it's happening because they're the one doing it. They'll tell you, no, you know, just basically shut up. Like, mm -hmm. you know, deal with it. <laughs> yeah, keep your mm -hmm. mouth closed, deal with it. Um, this is the way it's going to be. And people have done that for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So what do you as a black social worker want white social workers to know? If you ha like you have the platform here and you have us listening, um, what would you most like us to know? Just, um, I would say just every, every we, we taught, we have um, trainings on cultural competency. I yeah. think that when we do trainings on cultural competency, we need to put the black community into there as well oh, because, sure. and not just you know we've done things for like you know anyone who doesn't speak english so there's an english mm -hmm. is not their first language but mm -hmm. just the, with the history of what the black community has gone through um keeping that in mind when you are interacting with a black person um mm -hmm. you know whether it's in whatever system it is, it can be DCF, homelessness, it can be um, in court, whatever that is, just remembering the things that they've been through. So being sensitive, culturally sensitive to that, because that's a culture. We just, I mean, it's not that we're just now noticing, we're just now acknowledging that this mm -hmm. is a culture, that this is something mm -hmm. that's happening. So having the ability to acknowledge that these are this these everyone the black community is traumatized so looking yeah. at them from a trauma lens and keeping that in mind with everything that you do mm -hmm. yep so let's talk more about this trauma lens because i think that's a lens through which i see the world mm -hmm. uh, but we know that there's a lot of people and i would say this goes for white folks black folks brown folks however you identify who don't want to look at trauma no, <clears throat> and we've had a couple guests on the show already have talked about how white folks unwillingness to look at their own trauma mm -hmm. is what is keeping us stuck and keeping a lot of this cycle of hate perpetuated. So, uh, and I asked Dr. Damon this last night, what words of experience or strength or hope would you give to somebody who's like, I, I don't want to do like, it, you know, it, it, I, I'm fine. How would you inspire them to maybe take it, take a deeper look? Um. I would say that no one's fine. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Um, you know, if you wake up this morning, there's there's just so much that's going on all the mm -hmm. time. No one is fine and everyone has a deep root. And and really, I don't know if, if it's a stigma, but the point of healing from your trauma is to become the best you can be. You know, I, I had someone say this to me, and this is why I started to do trauma work. I got into EMDR therapy. Someone said to me, Soraya, you're great now. Imagine, imagine what you would be like if you healed. Yeah. And that stayed with me because yeah. that's, that's huge. If that, that's the whole point of trauma work is to be your mm -hmm. best self, to get past yeah. the things that are holding you back. Because who knows what you can do if you got past that or who you would be if you got past those things that you're not addressing. Right. I, you're preaching to the choir with me because that's been my experience and, and I agree with that wholeheartedly. And I, I like that. And I think I'm going to use that where when people are like, why, you know, why should I do this work? Uh, I think a lot of it is validating. Look how far you've come. You've managed to survive this thing called life, but um, maybe think of, of how much better it could be or that, that you're worthy and deserving of being the fullest expression of yourself. It's true. I mean, I think recently just with, with the quarantine happening and all these things, I've kind of had my own like revelation of like, if you're gonna, if you're gonna, you know, be here, might as well live your full life. 
And so mm -hmm. that's what trauma is. If you think, you know, you get to that place of like, oh no, I don't need to, I'm good. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's the word trauma is, there's, there's a little bit of heaviness there, but mm -hmm. like I said, it's, it's resiliency too. You can't talk about trauma without resiliency. Mm -hmm. You can't talk about trauma without recovery mm -hmm. too. So. so let me ask, let me ask a really hard question because I, I even struggle with how to help clients I work with address this, that it, it, this is old DSM wording, but something about it really stuck with me that one of the symptoms of trauma can be the sense of a foreshortened future, mm -hmm. um, could be a sense of, of almost, I don't really like the term learn helplessness, but ingrained helplessness, because who's going to care about me anyway? Mm -hmm. uh, I might not live to see tomorrow anyway, so just forget it. Um, and I would imagine in any marginalized, because I know I've experienced that because of some of my marginalized identities, and I'm a very privileged person, and I've still experienced that. So do you see that being an issue, let's say, with some people of color maybe having a hesitancy to even address therapy or help, feeling like nobody cares anyway, or nothing's going to ever be better anyway? Um, I, I can I can identify, I can understand that. Um, it, it makes, it makes sense. Um, and I wouldn't want to, I would say, I, I can't find the word. I wouldn't want to minimize someone's experience or what, what they feel, you know, everyone's valid to feel that I, I've had a, that feeling personally, yeah. but for, I would say for me personally, I can only speak for myself. Um, knowing your why, you know, or finding some sort of, that's what they do. Like, I'm, I'm excited to find, to read your 12 steps, but finding um, some sort of hopes, finding something, anything, anything to, to keep you going just for the next day. That's usually um, how it works. Um, and even if it's like hour by hour, you know, day by day, that's, that's really, that's, for me, that's how it worked. And Mm -hmm. one day turns into two days turn into three days um and like I said that's that's the really the resiliency and I and I can understand someone saying um why try things are not going to change um but yeah I, I I can understand that I'm stuck myself because yeah I can understand I personally have had that experience and so it's it's kind of hard um yeah. for, to, to get someone out of that so, so I, I love this, this wording of find your why. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I agree 100%. Mm -hmm. So let's say a person does come to you who feels so beaten down and so exhausted by the impact of racism on their body, on their system, on their way of life. Um, and they might say to you, I just, I, I can't. Um, where might you start? helping somebody to find their why who just feels so exhausted by all of this um for again i can only speak on myself for me speak i think yourself, yeah. i think of other people i don't just think okay. of myself i think mm -hmm. of you know the little black girl who who was feeling the same way i felt you yeah. know who, who didn't see an image of herself um mm -hmm. so think of you know, just like we're talking about generational trauma, things that have happened in the past, that's what hope is, is the future. So mm -hmm. the your future self or the future people that you will impact or there's, for me, specifically the way I got out of that, um, the feeling of just hopelessness was, like, like I said, thinking of other people. That's why I got into social work. I thought of, there's so many people who may feel like they don't have hope but when you think of someone else, that kind of gives you, that gives you hope. When you're not mm -hmm. focusing so much on me, mm -hmm. you know, then that takes the life off of you, take, light, take the light out of you and mm -hmm. put it on someone else. Um, mm -hmm. So that's usually what helped me. That's beautiful. So as we're nearing the end of our interview, is there anything else you'd like to share with us about this topic? Anything else you want to put out there? Um, well, kind of some, just piggybacking off the last thing that I said, um, we talked about uh, generational trauma, things that have happened in the past and that are perpetuated and, and stays inside of us. Um, but as I said before, you know, we kind of look at the generational legacy that we can, can do too. That's what we're doing right now. We're creating a legacy. You know, there's so many 
um, younger people who are finding hope. And now, because of the change and the things that we're doing, they get to see themselves in a new identity. So we're changing, we're making change. So we can, we're stopping the, the pain, we're healing, we're talking about it, we're exposing it. And now people are gonna be able to heal. The more they talk about, this has happened to me, this is, this is what I've experienced, this is, this, is, um, this is what I want people to know, um, then they'll be able to heal. You know, and someone will believe them, someone will acknowledge their experience, and that's how they'll be able to heal. That's how you heal safely, you know? Fantastic. I love your energy. I love your enthusiasm. And I know that you're a sign of hope for anybody you would come into contact with. Yeah, and uh, thank you for, for sharing with us tonight. So how can people be in touch with you? Do you have any other outlets besides here on Facebook? Yes, um, I do. And I can... I don't I guess that they don't have it in the chat, but I can, um, in our, in the Facebook live, I can definitely put my virtual, yep. uh, Great. virtual card, business card, mm -hmm. and I have, uh, Instagram and yeah, you guys can follow me. What's your Instagram? Um, I have it as consulting.healingwounds. Beautiful. I will tag that as well for sure. And uh, yeah, so I want to invite everybody who's still with us tonight or watching this on the recording to join us for one more live cast this week, tomorrow night at 730 Eastern. Uh, Blaze Harris, who's a good friend of mine, will be joining us from North Carolina speaking on Black Men Feel and just the whole issue of uh, working with mental health specifically amongst black men. You're not gonna wanna miss him. He is a character and a half. And I mean that very affectionately um, in terms of what he does in, in public safety, as well as being a mental health clinician and really speaking as a, as a true advocate. And Soraya, I thank you again so much for being here with us tonight. And I look forward to hearing more about where your career takes you and where your research is gonna go. And again, thanks for being on the livecast with us. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much.